This is Dead Stick Radio, episode 14, recorded live on June 22nd, 2020. Crichton King, creator of Griplock Ties. Yeah. Anyway, so let, let, let's get into this a little bit and introduce people to you. So um, I met Crichton uh, through Formula One Air Racing. He's got one of the coolest cassettes I've ever seen. I don't know if you can call it cassette anymore. Uh, I call it cassette TT with the t- last teaser. Or, oh yeah, capital, capital T's, right? Yeah, capital <laughs> T's, yeah. Because he converted his normal conventional tailed airplane to a T tail, yeah. including doing all the design and build himself in his garage. That is the definition of the EAA. Yeah. And something not many people do anymore. Yeah. So then, but wait, let's keep going here. On top of that, you have invented, you discovered, you got f- frustrated and fed up with uh uh tie wraps cutting yep. through engine mounts and so on mm-hmm. so you designed your own uh tie wrap with rubber lining and it's called yep. a grip lock tie yep and now they're also for sale all over the country and the world how many countries are you in now like a hundred um countries? just with today's last shipment to the czech republic for uh, a bigger order um that should be you know, we're in Asia, we're in Europe, we're in um, the European Union and Canada. Yeah, guys carrying in Canada, this guys in Mexico and Colombia and Brazil and uh, New Zealand. So we're we're growing, we're growing. I mean, we're still small, but um, you know, we grew a bunch last year. We were really kicking butt this year till the Corona thing kind of hurt us, but. Um, but last week was an awesome week and we're just continuing to grow. So people, people need to eventually learn how regular zip ties are old technology. It's a 60 year old design. So, um, yeah. grip lock ties is like an eight L clamp slash zip tie, bringing the best together is convenient. It's light. It's strong. It's rubber lined. It's padded. It protects wires. It, uh, it slices, it dices, it removes, it's removable. So, Grip lock ties. It's and it's also more money than regular zip ties because the quality is so much better. Because so what's, we use uh, the best materials, Dupont. And if you want a half price, just use it twice. Why don't Why don't we get into that a little bit? Man, that's yeah, the let's, best let's, slogan let's, ever. That's yeah. what I've been doing too. Yeah. So just to show everybody these things kind of up close, crane has got one too. I don't know if my camera does very well here. It's it looks like a standard tie wrap from the back, except it says uh, grip lock ties all over it. Mm-hmm. But when you flip it over, it's got this red or blue or orange liner of rubber. So mm-hmm. the problem is we use we use these things as standard tie wrap all over airplanes, zip ties everywhere. They hold wires together. They hold uh, hoses together. Um, they're used everywhere. But the problem is over time they chafe, and they'll even chafe through steel tubing. So mm-hmm. it can cause a whole bunch of problems, structural failures. Um, shorted wires, uh, leaky hoses, uh, ruptured tubing, broken brake lines. What did I miss? Crashing and burning and dying because you wanted to save 20 cents on a zip tie. Yeah. Yeah. And then they, all, they get old and they crack fast. So this one here now. So what, what, tell us a story a little bit about, about where these came from. Like what was your, when did it start? First of all. So when it really comes down to, um, I was working on my race airplane, last lap player, and I was playing around with uh, cooling and trying to fix that. And so I installed a four channel CHT and I was running wires along the engine mount and um, I was using orange tape around the engine mount and orange zip ties. So it all kind of match. Yeah. His plane's orange and blue. (laughs) Yeah. And so I, I, I ran out of orange tape. So I went over to Lowe's. And I said, hey, I need some orange tape. And they're like, boy, we don't sell orange tape here. That's the other place. And we just sell blue tape. And I'm like, all right, whatever. Some old dude, he's trying to be funny. But they were out of orange tape. So I thought, well, just give me the rubber line zip ties. Because I was using orange tape to pad the engine mount so the zip ties wouldn't ruin the engine mount. So, right. Um, so I said, well, just wear the rubber line zip ties. I said, well, they're rubber line zip ties. I went over there. They didn't have any rubber line cushion zip ties. 
So I thought, that's strange. So I looked, I called him over and he looked on his little app on his phone and he couldn't find him. And I looked on Amazon, I looked on Granger, and I looked on all kinds of electrical wholesale supply stuff and nobody had any. I thought, well, that's weird. So I went out to the airport and I used black black tape and regular zip ties and put it all together. And a couple of days later, I was thinking about it and uh, came up with the idea. And I was in, involved in auto racing at the time. I talked to a couple of buddies and looked at race cars and and uh i was at oshkosh a few months later it's about one o'clock in the morning my buddy mark Patey and his wife susie were there and i'd known him for years and and uh i said i said well i got this idea and um he's like well what do you got and so i said well you take a rubber a zip tie put a rubber lining around it doesn't move and it doesn't scratch the paint he goes that's brilliant i want in how much can i own so that's how i became partners with uh, Mark and Mike Patey and and uh, they had a product development company at the time, but and so we started developing grip lock ties. So what year was that? That was about five years ago. So thirteen ish, fourteen, fifteen, uh, fifteen, fifteen, sixteen. Yeah, right. Yeah. So what's the process behind that? So then, what did you do? Like you drew one up in SolidWorks or something? Or no, I drew it up on a piece of paper. That's how I, I work. <laughs> I, I have paper drawings of stuff. So right. Um, I draw it on paper, and then I, we went and had a meeting. We got back from Oshkosh, and and everyone, everyone there and their engineers, they had like 20 engineers on staff. And so I worked with a guy, and and I drew it up, and and uh, they started working on it. We had a few distractions here and there, and they sold the company, and we separated it out and different stuff. So it took a while before we got back to it. Yeah. And, uh, so we, this we is had, patented too, right? Yeah, we have patents in Canada and the U.S. and South Korea and China and the European Union and Japan and Australia and South Africa, which is really under the U.K. So, but all over. So, we've got tons of patents. So you took it, you drew it out nicely. Then what? So this is kind of good for the the aspiring entrepreneurs out there. So how do you take a product from a, a drawing to a prototype? So what I do is I have on my phone, um, I have a, a file in here and I, and I write down and it's titled uh, Cool Stuff to Patent, right? And when I have an idea, I write it down in there. Right. And then I draw a picture and, and um, you know, here's, here's one that I, that I drew, but you can't see Ooh. it because it's not yet. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, yeah, most of the time when you come up with a great idea, um, you know, I've, I have a, a, a business degree with an emphasis in marketing. And so, you know, product development and we study that in school and and uh, kind of a um, home taught engineer. I love reading engineering books. Um, but uh, a lot of times when you have a cool idea, somebody else already had it first. So, right. so I encourage everyone. You know, people ask me this question every time, like, how do you bring a product to market? Well, you're going to have like ideas, but but 99 percent of them were already somebody else's idea or they weren't good ideas in the first place, um, because maybe somebody already made it and it's a commercial failure because only. Only five people want it and, yeah, you know, maybe you can create a market with five people, but um, most times somebody's already done it. So I, I do this all the time. When I have a good idea, I write it down on my phone. And then instead of going on Facebook, you, you try to go through that. And usually you can find the product on Amazon. Or you can find it, you know, if it's more specific to engineering or aviation, you can find it somewhere else. And a lot of times you may see that product and you can make an improvement to it. But um, uh, I've had a lot of great ideas, but Grip Lock Ties is the only one that's, that's – uh, was really worth investing lots of money into. So, um, because my best idea was marrying my wife, but uh, you know, you guys can't have her. Oh, so. speak of the devil, but yeah, there. there she is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was good timing. Yeah, she's wearing a she's wearing a cassette shirt, by the way. So pretty cool. So oh, yeah. she's making T-shirts up here. This this grip lock ties world domination headquarters is actually my wife's craft loft. But uh, don't tell. Oh me yeah. About. Yeah, you're you're in your loft at your house. So I built a building in the backyard to build airplanes, and yeah. above it is 
is this room. So it's about it's about 800 square feet of uh, crafting, and I store grip lock ties here, and this is where my office is, and printers and sticker making stuff, and um, you know. Uh, what's uh what's in the shop downstairs so the shop is where i build cat is where i build airplanes um yep. so right now i have um uh carbon cowling for uh, and my car my mold for cassets um mold so i've got um cassette cowling down there that i was going to put on my airplane before reno last year but it's too light so yeah. i can't put it on and uh then I, my cub is down there. So a few slides of my cub and, and that's all cut apart and I'm moving the wing and doing some cool stuff to the cub and trying to pull some weight out of it and make it perform even better. So let's talk about that for a minute. So that cub was your dad's or still is your dad's. So when I was four years old, I went to Oshkosh for the first time in 1976, 1977, 77. And um, we went there, and Dad decided what airplane he's going to buy, and he bought a set of plans from Wagero. I think there was eighty-five bucks, and um, he started building that Cub in the garage, um, piece by piece, tube by tube, weld by weld, and uh, fourteen years later, we got it flying. So, and uh, it's been flying now about about thirty years. So. Right, 30 years up till what a year up and a half ago, about a year ago. and a half ago when I broke it. So, yeah, yeah, I was uh screwing around, we were taking off on the beach and doing some filming, and and uh, we had a big crosswind, and I ended up taking off on the beach and back in the water, and crosswind turned into a tailwind, and I ended up uh, flipping it over upside down. So, that was that was a bad day. Ended up on TV and everything it was horrible. So, <laughs> but yeah, but the Cub really, I mean, it had been flying 30 years, you know, it needed, it needed some, some loving. It did. So, um, when I was 18, I actually cut the top of the airplane off and changed it for some other wings from J3 wings to P18 wings. And I screwed up on the incidents of the wing and, so I'm fixing that. I cut the whole top of the cub off, and now I move the wing forward five inches to help the CG because we've got a about a 210 horse 0360 on it, and um, now it's just here, and it's it's got some. It's a great cub, so um, it was pretty light. So it weighed just over a thousand pounds before with an 0360 and 31s. So the goal now is is to be under a thousand pounds with 35s and uh you know i took nine pounds out of out of the floorboards by building out of carbon so you're putting uh, 35s on that thing yeah yep i had 31s but 35s are even better so yeah why well aren't they just too heavy at that point like is, no, isn't I mean, it like after like 29s the, it's not worth it totally worth it absolutely yeah to go from like 850s to 26s was like wow that's cool but when you go from like a 26 to a 31 it's night and day different and then anyone that's run 31s and 35s will tell you that the 35s are that much better than the 31s so you just it's like you land and don't care like you run over sagebrush you run over like tractors i mean it's just <laughs> like i mean like small tractors but it's it's amazing what those big tires do and with the monster sh the tk1 shocks so yeah because yeah. i've got 12 inches of travel so i actually i prototype those shocks with that uh that, that you can get now through tk1 monster so tony and i worked on those and i built the first uh sets of prototypes and did all the testing and when uh, was that it was about four years ago. So, oh, that's pretty recent. Uh-huh. Yeah, I came up with the idea of grip lock ties and then came up with that. And then I was going to do all the welding and Tony was going to do the shock part. And then I just needed to focus on one thing. So did it come uh, out of your truck world? Your truck yeah, racing world? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it came out of rock crawling, competition rock crawling. And um, Tony was was the guy that made shocks in the rock crawling world. A lot of air shocks, lightweight stuff. Um, 
And so I was talking to Tony one time. I said, yeah, this is what I want to do with my cub. And he was getting into airplanes at the time. And we talked about it and drew some stuff up and text message pictures back and forth. And I built some prototypes. And he built shocks and then tested them on my airplane. And and uh, it took a few iterations. But I really think those TK1 Monster shocks are really the best ones out there. So um, there are some other guys making some shocks. And and they're and they're also an improvement over stock, but coil springs can bind at a certain point where air shocks don't. They just keep compressing the air, so it's progressive. Where a coil spring will bind to a certain point, and those springs will, and then it. Yeah, then, and then you're out of travel. Then you're, you're out done. of travel. You're right. You bought them out. Right. Yeah, and and all that force you stored up through that spring now hits everything at once. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a big bang at that point because yeah. you're totally bottomed. There is no suspension left. Right. So coil springs have been around, you know, on, people put coil springs on cubs for years, taking out bungees, put on coil springs. Um, the air shock is really the the, the game changer. Because, is that with trucks too, though? So the thing, the thing that's different between trucks and airplanes is like a race truck. Like if you look at a trophy truck, right? Uh, the runs Baja runs short course, which is where I spent, you know, 12 years in tire development with Max's tires. Um, those have a, a heat issue because they're cycling back and forth and back and forth the whole time, moving fluid and gaining yeah. a lot of heat. So they have to have large volumes and fluid reservoirs and cooling fins and stuff. And that's, that's because it's re- repetitive. It's over and yeah. over and over again. The where friction air- creates the heat. Right. Yeah. Because it's, it's doing work by dampening. The fluid is dampening the travel. Usually the coils are providing the suspension and the right. fluid is just dampening where with an air shock, you have the air charge in there and it provides the boy. It's, it's an air ride system, right? Yeah. And then you have the fluid that then goes through the dampening, the holes in the, in the piston. Okay. And that has to slide through it. And those will heat up too. Um, if you try to, do long things with them. They're great for rock crawling. Yeah. competition, rock crawling, trail riding stuff. Great because you're not beating them that hard. Yeah. Um, but truck but racing, different story. Truck racing is different. And see an airplane, you've got like two movements. I mean, when you come down and that gear goes, you need it to spread out. Right. You now on a cub, you need that to spread out and absorb and then return back, and then come back and, uh, you know, you need that rebound controlled, and that's what the TK1s do is it controls, it dampens the extension, dampens the rebound, um, provides it provides the um, the suspension through air pressure. And air pressure doesn't weigh very much. Coil steel coil springs are solid steel, so air is pretty light. So you can use nitrogen if you want or helium, and then it'll float. So. Yeah. With 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 those air shocks though, is there a chance yeah. that over time they'll leak or whatever, and then you'll lose your your yep. ride? Yep. Just like on your on your nose gear on your Piper Arrow, right? Right. It's an air shock, or your mains on your Cherokee, right? After oh, a while. of course. So my tri pacer, I rebuilt the nose gear on the tri pacer um, for this annual, you know, a couple months ago, and the last time we rebuilt that was 25 years ago <laughs> so yeah so my cub um i have you know prototype number number three number four three or four on my cub and i ran them for four years never added air never did anything to them nothing the whole, so time. Other, the whole time yep And I did it on purpose. I wanted to just prove that it didn't need it. Some other guys have, you know, if if you don't keep them clean um, or you put them in a boot and trap dirt in there, you can you can damage the seals. You know, they're just rubber O-rings. And so they can wear out. But, you know, you can send them to Tony and he'll rebuild them in a couple days and send back to you. So for almost nothing. Yeah, it sounds pretty straightforward. Yeah. Yeah, his. I, I'm a, a believer. The other guys that, I mean, the main other guys out there is Acme, good guys. Um, yeah. Their shock is, is just different. It's it's less expensive. It looks a little cleaner because it doesn't have the dual tubes. Um, I don't think it has a aerodynamic advantage. I mean, it's 
one two be right after the next one aerodynamically. I don't think it makes much difference, but yeah, yeah. Um, but it looks a little cleaner and it's a little bit cheaper, but you have less travel. So I think if you really want the performance, you go with the TK ones. If you want a little cleaner look, you go with, and save a few bucks, go with the Acme. So right. And are the Acme ones coil suspension? They're, they're coils. Right. So they're good guys over there and Tony's Tony's a good guy and and I think it's cool that we're getting all this suspension in in backcountry flying. So I love backcountry. So do we uh, need um do we need those safety cables? So if you if you spring a leak in a shock, lose well, the shock. One thing, I mean they they're limited internally where like with a bungee cord, when a bungee cord breaks, okay, and it separates out, you know, then it it ends up going on a bolt, right? And so that's when uh, those cables are most needed. Where the way that the three tube system works, shock springs a leak, it actually closes it back on itself. So it uh. won't fit as much. But you know, cables are um, uh, cables can they can help you when a bolt breaks at the top of your cabane strut. So, I mean, you know, you talk to people that run cables. It's because sometimes they really help when you break something. Um, yeah, you go flat, flat. Yeah. You know, the really thing is, is the flat isn't a, a really big issue because, you know, most of those shocks are running at 150 PSI, which you get from a regular compressor. So, oh, yeah. uh, you know, you can carry a bike, a little bike compressor that's this big, like you carry with your bike, but they press the valve and pump them back up. So. Really? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Because you only need about 150 PSI. I mean, that's what you know, a, a regular street bike runs, you know, with 700 series bicycle tires. So, yeah. 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 So you can do that. Um, cables are nice. Tony's working on some, uh, uh, some synthetic rope. So we were talking about that a couple of years ago and now he's done it. So darn it. I wanted to do it first, but, uh, so he's using a synthetic cable. So it's a lot lighter to do it. So, Oh, I'm but, interested. Oh Yeah. Yeah, it's cool because so much lighter. So I was I tried to use synthetic cable as rudder pedals, as rudder cables on my uh on last lap player. Yeah. But uh the stretch was it was too much. It was too much. Yeah. It's probably hard on the brakes, because when you when you press hard on the brakes, you got max stretch in your cables, right? Um you know, the the problem with the new rudder cable system on last up player is that I have I used to have a it's about five inches on on the rudder horn, right? Okay. Yeah. So the center to the end is two and a half inches, right? So it's five inches wide. But I wanted to move it all inside and completely contained within my tail post. And so I needed to be smaller. So I moved the attachment on the rudder pedal. You know, from from here on the rudder pedal down to here, you know. So my mechanical advantage is doubled. So the amount of oh, you need bigger cables. Force. Yeah, so uh -huh. I need bigger cables. So I was trying to save weight with with different cables, and in the end, like you'd press on the rudder pedals and go both go, they'd both stretch. <laughs> so I replaced the cables several times. So now I've got a, a three sixteenths cable because the eighth inch that I used Which to is run standard. Yeah. Yeah. So, man, eh, you know, live and learn. So, <laughs> so let's talk about that a little bit more. So what you did is you took a, a normal tail, which was like vertical and then the horizontal is kind of in the middle. Yeah. And then you cut all it off at the laundrons. Yep. Is that right? And then you, you were you rebuilt the entire rear end of the airplane using uh -huh. some old pictures from the 70s as inspiration kind of so there was um i don't know if you see it all right so there was yeah okay so there was i saw a picture of this cassette at one point so yeah this detail cassette i've got like reflection it looks see. great to me yeah and i was like that looks awesome so i talked to the builder of it so Who these was are the builder? Some original pictures um i'm not good with names but he's dead now so oh. yeah cool guy though he built it uh he died of cancer a couple years ago yeah um but he, that's him there in the pictures doing it but he he built the airplane flew it for a while it was really cool it had a it had a, an owl wing on it but um 
he said it was great, but he sold the airplane to another guy, but he decided to fly his Cassett in IMC and it, you know, he plowed himself into the ground at 300 miles an hour in Florida. Yeah. And um, he said the tail was fine. So he actually has the original tail. <laughs> He's like, I'll just sell it to you. And I'm like, I don't want like, I don't like flying with crash parts. I think it's bad luck. <laughs> yeah. So what you did is to get the, the so the problem with T-tails is structurally, the stick, yeah, yeah, that's so, the original one, right? So that's, that's the original. stock tail. Yeah. That's which way am I going here? I'm going that way. Yeah, so I cut it off. Right. So then what you did is you, you brought the Londrons back to a single tail post like the Cassette has, which is like, what, inch or inch and an eighth or something? Tubing? Three-quarter three inch tubing yeah. with a doubler where the top Londrons attach in. Um, yeah. You replaced it with two square posts yeah. about three inches wide to give the tail the stiffness. So the problem with T-tails is if you can imagine this, they tend to flutter at high speeds, right? They get really... To, to build that stiffness up, it's difficult. Yeah, so what you did is you spread out the post so that the tail post of the airplane was quite wide, which then gave you the stiffness in the vertical stabilizer to fly really fast. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then you built your hinges, and then one of the coolest things is you then built a, a aluminum rudder for it. Yeah, that's that's yeah. the new vertical stabilizer right there. Yeah, that's the structure of it. It's all... I was I first was going to build it all carbon, but you know here's the hard part is okay so to go from steel to carbon back to steel in twenty inches, yeah like it wasn't going to save any weight, so I just welded out of steel. So, and probably like easier to engineer. Fiber. Oh yeah, and then you covered it in carbon. That's right. Yeah, so there's a carbon cover over it. So yeah. And then just fix the fabric. Yep. So did you actually yeah, pick so up any extra speed by doing all this stuff, all this work? Yeah. You know, it, it, uh, it gained about five pounds because my horizontal is bigger and stuff. And it's uh, gained about six miles an hour. So, yeah, it was a little faster. I mean, we're, we're 40 miles an hour faster than we used to be. Um, yeah, you know, it's crazy. Trust me, I know. Yeah. So... Um, it's, it's a fun, the cool thing about a cassette is, is like a lot of people want, like, I want a stock cassette. Okay. You can build a stock cassette and that's cool. It's a great flying airplane. But the cool thing about them is like, you can add so many things to it. You can change wings, the wing, the wings attach you can change the tail. You know, uh, I've built lots of engine mounts, um, longer engine mounts and different cowlings and. The only thing left original of my cassette is about like the middle part. So yeah, yeah, my new racer is kind of similar. Like, there's almost no stock cassette left. Yeah, well, I don't think it really exists. We've never seen photos. Uh, it's just, it's just supposedly he has this cassette super cassette thing he's working on. No one's ever seen photos. Been working on it for years. I mean, thousand points of light, whatever. But you know, <laughs> I don't believe it exists. So. You know what my favorite part of this new airplane is? It yeah. has ADSB. Yeah. <laughs> that sucks. You shouldn't have to have that. Why the oh, I don't have to. I choose it. it. I love it. Okay. I think everybody should have it. I know. <laughs> See, the thing is, in the United States, we have a constitution. Okay? The constitution guarantees our rights. In Canada, you don't have that. So, you know. That's true, actually. Yeah. Okay. Let. All right. Let, let's so give people some backstory here. Tyranny of ADSB. <laughs> hashtag. Yeah. Let's hear it. ADSB tyranny. Yeah. Let's hear it. So I think the problem the problem I've got with ADSB is, um, it was supposed to be for more safety, right? Right. So you can see where the other no more emitters. Yeah. The problem is, is it just makes people complacent. They rely upon the technology to be looking on their panel yeah, and that doesn't do anything good for missing balloons or birds or flocks of birds or um, ultralights or anything else because people look at their screen. I had a guy two weeks ago want to enter the pattern on middle of base leg because he couldn't find me on his ADSB in my non-electric airplane. 
Uh-huh. And he, and he threw all this crap at me. And it's like, dude, he's like, well, I can't see you on my screen. I said, well, get your eyes out of the cockpit. You know, see and avoid. It's still the rule. ADSB is supposed to help. It's not supposed to be your crutch and your only solution for, for avoidance. Yeah, it's not supposed to take over visual. Yeah. It's still visual as in VFR. Yeah. But that's what pe- that's what it's doing quickly is it's making lazy pilots. Now, the real problem with ADSB is not just that it shows another airplane, is that Billy plane spotter in his mom's basement in Australia can track you in Canada or a guy in North Carolina or anywhere and know where he started and where he's going and what speed he's at and all that kind of stuff. It's a huge invasion of privacy. There was a guy a couple of weeks ago on Facebook who said, I think I just witnessed a crash because so-and-so just squawked 7,700 and, and I followed him all the way down. I think he's in the middle of this street. What? <laughs> What's he doing? This kid's from, he's in Australia, and this is in North Carolina. Why does he need to know? He has no need to know. He doesn't know the guy. He can't offer assistance. He's not in another airplane. He's not providing separation. It's none of his business what that guy is doing at all. In the same way, it's not any of the business whether what how fast Brian drove to work yesterday. <laughs> Or whether Scott drove to work and went over the speed limit. Right. But every time we give the government an opportunity to track us, it will come back and haunt us. Right, which is what it is. Yes, it's tracking. And it's just a matter of time when they just look at it and go, oh, well, you know, you came 10 feet within this class B. So, you know, here's your, here's your fine. Or you went 254 knots below 10,000 feet. So here's here's your here's your violation. So it's it's a big problem. So the FAA has recognized that there is some problem with privacy. So you can ask the FAA to not publish your information, but your airplane is still broadcasting it. So there are websites out there of networks of people with with a Raspberry Pi and an antenna, and they can build it for 25 bucks off of parts. Yeah, you built that these, for how, mu- how much did that cost you, Brian? This is a Stratix, and I think it cost me yeah. maybe 250 Canadian. It's uh, It came with everything, yeah. including the antennas. Yeah. So, so you can take that and pick up all those signals, and then you can put that through the network of all these private guys, and now you can track me and where I'm at. Yeah. Oh, it's, so now, like, say, say, Scott, you have a, you want to go take a client from other engineering firm, okay? Yeah. And so they, they just you have to know that Scott, CEO of engineering firm Y, took off and flew to this mine site somewhere, and right. was there for two hours, and then he flew back, and it's none of their freaking business. It's none, of your, it's none of your ex-girlfriend's business or your ex-employer's business. What if I want to call in sick and go skiing, <clears throat> okay, and I want to fly to Squaw Valley? You can't. It's none of their business. But because of ADSB and because of this federal mandate, you have to now broadcast to every single person on the planet where you are. People should rise up against this tyranny. It's horrible. Yeah. If they did this in cars, if everybody with oh. a 1978 Pinto wagon had to spend 2500 bucks, put it in their Pinto, and then anybody that really likes Pintos, the Pinto spotters, can now look <laughs> online and find out where you drove your Pinto and where you got gas. And, and I see when you're speeding. Freak out. They would and freak out about that. Why you know, should we, as pilots in my private aircraft, traveling in my free country have to broadcast that information it's ridiculous no no it's not totally free <laughs> yeah it should be freer it's freer than canada get, get at least we can sell guns <laughs> for now for yeah. now by the way to all your canadian viewers if you want to get rid of your ar you can legally sell it to me for a hundred bucks or hunting <laughs> rifle or hunting rifle and i will buy it from you for a hundred dollars so it's got to be a good one, though. 
just to hold till the next election. Well, I can hold it for fifty dollars. So oh. I can hold it for fifty, plus you pay the shipping, or for a hundred dollars, I'll just buy it. So <laughs> we don't want them destroyed. You can no. buy it back later for two fifty. It'll be all right. It's Canadian, so it'll be. I don't know where that'll be, but <laughs> I don't know. So anyway, ADSB is tyranny. Fight it. Yeah. What, what's the solution though? Up. You want to well, get woke? Well, get woke uh, about them following you. <laughs> Well, there's What's there's the a solution? few well there's a few solutions that the at least the, in the American system they have so they in the American system you guys are allowed to have uh, the the secondary band the uh, the UAT band what is it the uh, nine seventy eight band which allows you to squawk uh, private mode which effectively doesn't send out your your end number your IKO number which is a good mm-hmm. step in the right direction but then as soon as you go within control zones you have to turn that off you have to go into to non anonymous right. mode. So that's that's mm-hmm. kind of useless there. Um, they also have wow. the uh, they call it the SWIM network, where the SWIM network is a, a network where all the American uh, government uh, antennas are all rebroadcasting that information onto the internet. So any guy who can who's who wants to uh, start looking at that information, he can just apply and say, "Hey, I'm writing an app. I want to do something with this information," and then the government's going to give them access to that data. So you can actually yep. submit to the the FAA and say, "I don't want my information sent." out on there and they will actually prevent that They'll prevent it from getting sent out to certain sources so you can say well i want this one for tracking for my family but i don't want others but that still doesn't solve the other major problem which you mentioned is is homebrew right. transmitters you're, and, and you're receivers spying on me brian you're <laughs> spying on me man hey, totally cool. i was so, watching for you Creighton, the other day yeah. <laughs> yeah the only way to get around it in the u.s right now is to have a non-electric airplane What's the, what, what does that mean? Can you have a battery and a starter? You can have a battery and you can have a starter, but you can't have an engine-driven electrical system. So, so the people that sell those turbine engine. alternators are going to uh-huh. make a killing. Yeah. 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 What, what would you do to change, the, to change the law, in your opinion, and uh-huh. what nobody is be? What's the fix? I think you could have a, a signal that is... You could have an airplane transmit a signal and it sends to another airplane within five miles and it could reply to that and it could be airplane to airplane. It could be encoded. doesn't have your ownership. doesn't have your end number. It's a dot. Just a, a traffic speed, dot. A dot, a speed, and altitude. That's it. The, the, you don't need the end number. You're not suddenly going to go, oh, well, November 567 Tango Bravo, he's going to hit me, but not Tango Sierra. <laughs> you know, like why? Why do we need all that information unless it's going to be used against us at some point? Yeah, and and I can understand, and that's why I guess that's the privacy motive of the UAT transmitters is that is that's okay because that's enough information just for anti-collision. But of course, uh, air traffic controllers they need to be able to distinguish between individual planes and what they are. And I, I think there's an actual they could always they could always tag them in their system already. Yeah, that's true. If that's you go true. in a center, you can find the blip and you can as- assign that the end number already in their system. Yeah. Right. Uh, like Squawk Ident, as soon as it lights yeah. up, dial in the end number. There you go. It's assigned. Yeah. But it's assigned <laughs> off some kind of hexadecimal key, right? Well, and, and there there is actually there is actually that capability right now already. Uh, so they offer these, uh, the FAA offers privacy, uh, they're called private IKO addresses. So you can basically, instead of putting in your end number, you can actually put in a flight ID. We have to pay a service and they give you flight IDs. You have to program it every time you take off. But you can also do these private IKO addresses, which you're allowed to change, I think it's every six months or so, or every three months, um, and those private IKO addresses. But then the problem is, you're talking over the radio, they're able to correlate okay this plane is taking off from here now they've correlated you with that uh, that IKO number and now you're de-anonymized for six months because you're not allowed to uh, apply for another one so there's still all these major problems with the system I think that there is actually a, a really good solution out there and it just uses uh, a little bit of technology we call encryption and uh, and I think uh, so Apple actually ran into this problem uh, several years ago and I know this acutely because I was developing a product with a friend of mine um, we were going to be uh, effectively helping uh, retail agents effectively track people so I'm the big baddie here <laughs> we're tracking effectively track people as they move between stores so you would be able to tell but you want yeah, I'm working for the man right here. So, he's a haircut. He's yeah. the man. 
<laughs> so, so the idea was uh, on an iPhone or an Android phone or any kind of mobile phone you might have, they're constantly yeah. transmitting um, their uh, their Bluetooth beacons and their uh, uh, Wi-Fi beacons, and they're constantly transmitting these beacons, and they're always the same identifier. So they were able mm-hmm. to start. We were able to start tracking people around, and Apple saw this, and there was a bunch of other companies doing this at the time, and uh, they said, okay, well, we're going to put a stop to this, and now every ten minutes, it's a, it's actually a random number between 10 and 20 minutes every iphone mm-hmm. as well as now android has jumped on the bandwagon of this too they yeah. they cycle out a completely random identifier and if that was capable in adsb you suddenly now would have that same security and safety where it can be cycling these numbers out without breaking old transmitters without breaking old receivers because the, mm-hmm. the moment you start messing with these protocols you start breaking receivers and start breaking the actual uh, safety and security so i think that would be a, a reasonable way to do it and then just add another protocol message that effectively lets the lets you communicate just with air traffic control if you have that turned on like privacy mode turned off send a different type of message with that encrypted data that this is my end number this is my ico number nobody else can read it it's just a blob that it doesn't understand and uh and you get that full privacy capability without having to actually modify old transmitters it's just a software update on on old ones and you're good to go so i think there's a really good technological way to to get around this type of stuff but of course nobody's really talking about that everyone's just talking about how legislatively bad it is and i completely agree i i i'm super annoyed that in canada we're going to be legislated to have uh the the standard the extended squitter um uh, adsb the 1090 transmitting up to satellites and with those 1090 ones uh we have no capability to do the privacy mode we can't do anonymous mode like uat can so uh, yeah. i'm super annoyed that we're going to be doing this and i want to see us change something out there for this but you know we need a we need we need that swelling of people pilots out there to get behind this otherwise it's not going to happen i'm yeah, putting a turbine I, I, alternator in <laughs> yeah. i think i think you've got some good ideas there um you know i've i've read something about you know encrypting and rolling and rolling ids um, because that technology exists and probably there's a lot of these new transmitters you could program that in there without without having to change the hardware um so I think, I think we're right. We need the we need the aviation community to to get woke to this. I mean, if we're going to use a term, right? They need to wake up to the fact that they're being spied on. It's interesting to me when I when I see a blatant violation of someone's privacy on a Facebook page, and I say, yeah. Check it out, guys. You know, ADSB is tyranny. ADSB is violating your privacy. And they're like, but I get free weather. Big deal. So it's still a violation. Out? Yeah. You want to sell out all your privacy for weather? There's a lot of people, they, they start to realize, they're like, you know, I never thought about that. That I can be tracked by my employer, my ex-wife, my ex-girlfriend, by my business competition. I can be... I can be followed in for child support. I can be I can be followed for all kinds of reasons. And I think one of the worst ones is there's a guy in his basement somewhere on the other side of the world tracking you and he has no freaking business tracking you. Like why do we allow this to happen? It's so 1984. Who it's approved really it? it's re- who approved it? Yeah. They, I'm really upset with AOPA and EAA for not stopping this. They pushed it back and they worked hard to push it back, but I don't think they did a good enough job of educating people about it. I think it's because they get, they're so tight with like the FAA is always forcing EAA to pay for tower services and all some other kind of stuff. So I think that they've got EAA wrapped around their little finger and that they didn't stand up for this when it should have been. I should call Jack Pelton maybe because Jack would probably fight this. This is probably Hightower's problem. I'm blaming this on Hightower. Do you have a cell phone? Jack I'm Pelton? Yeah, I'm not going to call Jack. For this. <laughs> so Jack's a great guy. I like Jack. He's a volunteered president. Like he doesn't get paid. Oh, so. yeah. Oh yeah, Jack Pelton is a total stud, and his wife is a pilot, and she's cool. And uh, they were the first customers of Best Tugs when we went to the first show. 
It was pretty cool. They are cool people that love aviation. Yeah. Huh. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, he's a cool guy. I like Jack Bowman. Let's uh let's talk about Formula One. All right. So how did you get into it? Because I I met you through F one. So um I'm a big boy. You know, I'm a larger than the average pilot. Um, been flying since I was a kid. When I was uh, 14, I started building a Hummel bird. And uh, I went to, uh, I saved up just to buy all the wood to build all the, all the uh, bulkhead formers. And I cut those out and I bought some blue and I started building a Hummel bird. And then I realized how it was nice. I thought I'd build a bigger one. And later years later, it's like, man, I'd really love a Hummel bird, but I'm too big for a 37 horsepower airplane um, at 9,000 foot density altitude is what we had most of the time. And I started looking for small airplanes that I could carry along with me um, with work when I was traveling with grip lock ties and um, Cassett came up and I was like, man, that is a super awesome airplane. It's small. It's fast. It's inexpensive. That's cool. Yeah. So I found, uh, I found a project, uh, they used to race back in the seventies. Was it that white one? No, no, it was another one. It's the one that I put the light combing in. So I oh, put yeah. a light combing and so you're going to put tons of fuel in it and building a carbon wing for it. And I started to, uh, think, well, I need to train better for this. And the uh, one came up on barnstormers one day and I bought it from, from a guy in Minneapolis and, um, Princeton, Minnesota, and I bought it from him. I went out there and bought it and brought it home. It took about 10 months to get the auto zone and the Harbor Freight out of it and uh, taught myself to fly it. So, And about that time, the first cassette I ever sat in was Jay Jones's cassette in Oshkosh, which is about the same time. The nickel. Yep, I sat in quad nickel with a slab wing and and I've always been a big boy. And he's like, yeah, hop in there. First time I ever met Jay. And um, <laughs> he was so cool because he, you know, I got in there. We closed the canopy. And I was like, hey, I can do that. He's like, you all right? And I'm like, yeah, I can operate all the controls. That's all I need. And uh, that was really cool. And um, the next day I drove to Michigan and bought a fuselage, a cassette fuselage that the guy had <laughs> and uh, for 250 bucks. So I drove all the way around the lake and picked that up and brought it back. And Jay came back to the trailer, back to the campground, and we became friends. And then I found that other cassette project and, and uh, started talking to Jay. And in 2010, Jay convinced me to come to Reno and be his crew. And um, I finished up my cassette, and Jay raced it in 2011. And he came out and flew, and he's like, this is a great flying cassette. This is awesome. It just looks like crap. And if it looks like crap to Jay, it was really crap. <laughs> the quad nickel's a little rough, right? Yeah. You know? What yeah. was yours so painted like? It was. It had a uh, single stage gray primer on the wings. The fuselage was white um, polytone with um, mildew on the inside fabric. <laughs> and because uh, it had been in Lock Haven in an open hangar. Yeah, yeah. And, um, dude, it was rough. It was rough. The first time I ever taxied it, I got to about 40 miles an hour and the tailwheel fell apart. And then it was heading for the weeds and I grabbed the brake and the master cylinder broke. And <laughs> luckily I was able to cut off the mag switches before it, uh, went in the dirt. So, <laughs> so, jeez. But I, Jay flew it in June and he's like, it's great, but it's ugly, but we'll still take it to Reno. And so I flew it one day, like the next day, and it was all great, and it was so ugly. So I cut off the fabric, and 28 days later, it was rebuilt, and uh, we took it to Reno. So. Right, in orange. Yep, orange and blue. Because when it was white and gray, you could not see it in the pattern. It was impossible to see. Oh, I bet. It'd be the yeah. worst airplane in gray. Oh, it was horrible. Yeah. It was just, it was flat out dangerous to fly that airplane gray. Yeah. Yeah, it should be bright. Every cassette, every small fast airplane should be bright. So and how'd you how'd you get further involved in the F1 group? You took it to Reno and you just started hanging so out with Jay? Yeah, so 2010 I was um I I went there with, with Jay as crew. Um 
you know, me and Ted and, and, uh, the next year, 2011, my airplane was there. Um, then, uh, Eve Hansen that owned the Cassett business, he passed away and I bought the Cassett business from his widow. And that really got me involved. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In 2012, I sold, I sold last lap player to Mike Mondell. Um, six months later, got smashed with a tornado. The hangar fell on it, bought it back from him. And, uh, Rebuilt it again, and and um, now it is what it is today. Yeah, yeah, and then I just keep changing it and playing with it, and I don't know. Most recently, I changed the hinge, the hinging for the canopy, so it's it doesn't lift anymore. So because it would it fly so much, there's enough lift, it would just it would move. And you'd end up with this like three sixteenths gap along along the front, and just a bunch of drag. So now it. Now, when it sits there, it sits low, but then it lifts up just enough so it's it's flush. It's yeah, yeah. So now I have to put a vent in it because now it's hot because <laughs> there's no more air coming. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. What's um? So for everybody listening, most or a lot of our our listeners have heard this from Brian and I already. Yeah. But what is Formula One racing like? What's your experience with it? Would you recommend it? I uh, here's the thing. Formula One racing is the real racing class. It's not converted warbirds. It's not converted trainers. It's not converted, uh, you know, grocery getter, Lancers. These are race airplanes. They're real, built around a formula. It's the most fair of all the racing classes because if you build it to the rules, and the rules have been mostly consistent in 70 years, you get to race not just yourself and the seven guys you line up with you raced john sharp in 1997 you raced john parker in 1980 when he first broke 250 you race rivets in 1967 when it first won the nationals you get to race steve whitman you get to race all those guys because deke slayton apollo astronaut yeah you get to race astronauts hood gibson deke slayton who'd had a cast it yeah still yeah. does flies all the time yeah he was in a midair Texas. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I agree with you. It's the coolest class because so sport class is cool too. I love sport class. That's super cool. But the way you win in sport class is just put bigger and bigger engines in it, right? Make more and more power. You can't do that in Formula One. You know, it's seven to one compression and the cams are set, you know, and the valves are set. And all that stuff and a stock carburetor, like you have to tweak aerodynamically. So it's an uh, airframe game. Yeah. You have to have 66 square feet of wing. You have to sit in a way that you can see. It's fixed pitch, it's fixed landing gear. You know, you've got um you've got cassettes like what yours is gonna be, which is gonna be, you know, really fast. It may be 205. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Dude, I'm gonna go so yeah. fast by you. It's going to be so fast. And I'm going to lap you twice. Yeah. Yeah, I know. We've done that to you before, but. <laughs> <laughs> I owe you a couple. We got to yeah. unwind this. <laughs> but the thing that's cool is it's still structurally, it's it's the cassette, right? With a different wing, a different, you know, and that's what's cool is. And then there's a guy, an airplane like Madness, right? Which is a 26 foot wing and it's all, and it's all fiberglass and, and that's fast. And there's. Lots of different guys are all following the same formula. And there's only so much you can do the engine. You've got to do the aero speed. Yeah, and, Wool's uh, airplane, DG, DG2, Friday yeah. Dot. Yeah. Um, Steve's airplane, Endeavor. Yeah. What is it, AR6? All one-off, yeah. single design, clean sheet designed airplanes, uh, designed specifically for racing the yep. three-mile oval. Yep. And you know what airplane has beat Endeavor? Which one? A Cassett with a Cato wing. <laughs> that suits beat Endeavor. You know. Oh, Vito. Yeah, Vito beat him. Scarlet Screamer. For those yeah. That's yeah, right. So, I remember that now. Yeah. So the cool thing is, is you can get, you can be in the top of the gold with a with a mid wing Cassett, and you can be in the top of the gold with a with a one off where you have to be um, Steve Senegal's size to fit in it. Right. For the prospective uh, pilots, 
mm-hmm. to win the gold, you need to do what? 260 mile an hour average speed laps with the O200. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's fast. I mean, cause we're 40 miles an hour faster than we used to be. And we still have 30 miles an hour to go. Maybe. Oh yeah. And you've done modification after modification, all of them aimed at speed. Yeah. The thing that we haven't done is built a really fast wing. And so that's what I had the molds made. And that's, that's the next thing is this fast wing. So, and light, you got to build a light. I need, I need a 500 pound racer. Try it. So is that what we can look forward to in 2020 and 2021? Well, we don't get a race for a while. So, um, we had that little mitter, and so they said we can't. Well, they said my pilot can't race for two years, and I don't think it was necessarily fully uh, fair the way that it was done. And so we're not bringing our airplane this year. Next year, maybe we'll. Maybe this year will be too hard to sit out, and we'll put somebody else in it for next year. You know, we um, we've got guys who want to fly it. Guys from Dave Holmgren that flew it in the past. Uh, Swade Swade wants to fly it. Um, other guys we could put in it and it's a fast airplane, but I didn't build anything fast for it this year. And I don't want to go to Reno without a f- being noticeably faster than the previous year. So, so 2021, maybe we'll have the new wing on it. 2022. Yep. And then after that, it's the clean sheet design that, that I think is going to be the goal after that. It's not just to be in the top three in the gold. I mean, we've been top five in the gold. Right. We want to be, we want to be top two. Uh, that, I think you we won't I, be top I, one by then. I think we can be, I think last lap player can be in the top of the gold. I think we can be third place, second place, third place on a good weekend with the new wing. So it'll be faster. Yeah, best. Yeah. It'll be faster than yours. So <laughs> no, no, that's not what I meant. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but then th- the goal after that is to beat John Sharp. Yeah. Now I don't want to just be Lowell. I want to beat John Sharp in 1997. I want to beat 42.3. That's the ultimate goal. It's been 23 years, and nobody's gone faster than John Sharp. Either he had a way figured out, or he was cheating. But I don't think he was cheating. I just think he had it all figured out, and there's no magic. It's just got to lower the drag and make it faster. So, and his airplane was heavy. It was like 650 pounds. Yeah. So it was a heavy airplane. It was almost as heavy as your red one before you start taking weight out of it. Yeah. So, so I don't know. Can you build one that's super low drag and it's 500 pounds? Maybe you'd have something there. So, I don't know. I was talking to Bruce Bohannon the other day because Bruce was the guy second place to Nemesis race after race after race. Yeah, for a decade. Yeah, and he could kill him off the line, but he didn't have the arrow to beat him because and pushy. Know, he, had, he had pushy galore. Yeah, and they had a yeah. short, stubby wing and a pusher prop, and the pusher prop won't work because it's in dirty air. Yeah. He's, he's like, at one point he said, I'm going to come back, but I'm going to come back with an airplane with the prop in the right spot. So recently on a conversation I had with him last week, I invited him to uh, race last lap player. So is he going to No. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, nah, I don't want to do that. <laughs> Worth a try. Yeah. But I did ask him and I kept you in suspense for just a minute. Yeah. 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 You had everybody going. <laughs> yeah. We're making good race. Con- we're making good content here. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. We have been all night, but we did talk about uh, altitude records. And what do you say? There's a lot of good stuff. I'm interested. Yep. I'm you know, Jason Busat lives like 50 miles from me. Uh huh. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I think what will be good great luck is when we set the record, then you can beat us. All right. Yeah. And then we'll then we'll build our our U two wing, and then we'll be yours. So I think Dude, it sounds like a fun challenge, doesn't it? I've been thinking about that record for a long time. Yeah, like six yeah. years. Uh huh. I just started thinking about it a couple of weeks ago. Because <laughs> <laughs> you got a long ways to go. 
Yeah. Well, it'll already go to 24. Yeah. Pretty easy. Yeah. 24. Yeah, it's that last 10, that's hard. Yeah. Yeah. So it'll go it'll go to 24 with a fat guy and a big cruise prop. <laughs> and no ADSB. <laughs> but and it gets there pretty quick. <laughs> I've never taken mine that high. I've been to like 10. I've not had no reason to go higher. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to have to try that. Anyways. Well, I did bring some oxygen though. <laughs> <laughs> I just aim it, put a race prop on it and just aim it for the sky and just let her just, go. Just hold that 120. And you just, the thing is, can you keep it cool? You can probably keep yours cool at 120. Oh, mine, mine easily stays cool. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, maybe I didn't go to 24. Maybe I only went to 17,999. Well, of course, right? Yeah, of course, yeah. You just Your altimeter was out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, like, turbocharged 0200? Holy crap, dude. That's... Yeah, that's there's some huge potential there. There really I is. I spent the whole year thinking about that already. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's a huge potential there. Yeah. Now, well, we've been thinking about putting last lap player in sport class. Just for banned from IF one. Yeah. We thought we'll talk to some guys about turbos and Epex motors and all kinds of stuff. So yeah, I don't know what we're gonna do. For for the record. <laughs> Just, I need to just finish my cub and then I can get back to racing airplanes. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Mr. Turbo is 50 miles from me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah SDS but, is like 180 miles from me. But you know who is my biggest business partner? Who? The two brothers that set a coast to coast speed record and 3K kilometer records and 100K kilometer records and 1,000K kilometer records. And they're like my best friends, and they live closer than 50 miles. <laughs> but they've never set an altitude record. Or have they? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what we're going to do. I just like flying my airplane. But you definitely got me thinking about altitude records. Oh, and so man. then I just, I just aimed it to, like, I've never flown it that high. Like, so Rich flew it back. He came back from Reno at like 14.5. But, you know, when I flew to Oshkosh a couple years ago, I went to like 12.5. But I really like about 12.5 feet. That's where they're really fun. But that's dangerous. <laughs> you, you know what the trick to that record, though, is you need to lighten the airplane up as much as possible. That's why you need to fly it. That's what I'm getting at. Right. Uh. But I could get a tapeworm. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I could even Zeta's bring my own oxygen small. system. Zeta's if you turbo that thing, uh, dude, I, I got wave right near me. Yeah. I don't think you need wave. But you, you need the block. Water. The wave's, the wave's going to end at 25 anyway. You don't need wave. Mm. You need a VFR block to at least 35. Yeah. It's not that hard. I mean, Canada, there's no airplanes. It's just Eskimos up there anyway. <laughs> no, I. You can, I'm sure you can find some airspace. So yeah, it yeah. is weird when you're in your cassette and a airliner flies underneath you. So I'm looking forward know. to it. Yeah, I did that in my Cub one time. I was just this is when I put the new engine on it and that big 86 inch Cato prop, and I'm like, I don't know. Let's just keep climbing, and it like. At seventeen nine nine nine, it still climbs eight hundred and fifty feet per minute. That's nuts. And it's sixty miles an hour. Dude, put an oxygen system in that thing. Oh yeah. I don't know how I mean this I think the record for an O three twenty powered cub was like twenty twenty six thousand or something. That seems easy. It really does. I would man, I'd love to try that. But you know what? I'm afraid of heights. I get up that high and it starts scaring me. <laughs> like it's freaky. I, I don't, I don't have that problem. If if I'm not strapped in, I'm afraid of heights. Yeah. But strapped well, in, no problem up there. So Thursday night, um, I went out to the airport. And I'm usually at the airport right now instead of talking to you guys. But it's okay. Um, <laughs> I usually go flying about, you know, for half an hour before it gets dark. 
And it's what's nice. And I flew out there and, and, and I just like, all right, the class B ends here and I can climb to 10 here and then I'm past it, you know? And I just, I had played with some stuff and I wanted to see what it'd do. And I got out there and, and at about 12, I got in a big mountain wave oh, and yeah? it beat the crap out of me. Like it, and I could You're see in it, the rotor. I could see, yeah, I could see it coming off. I mean, because in Salt Lake, there's a mountain and the valley and the mountain, right? Yeah. And so it's hard to get away from it. You got to go out over the lake. But um, there was just a, there's a bunch, of, I could see the air blowing. Like in the valley, it was still five knots, right? But you get up there and it was, you know, suddenly the GPS was like, yeah, you're doing like 50 knots. Freaking like rolled me like 90 degrees, like quick. And I thought, all right, okay, I don't want to play with this today. And uh, pulled the power back. And I think here's here's the key. Is you, you need to build a cow flap. Because you got to be able to close it off on the way down. Because when you're climbing and you're trying to climb at 120 and you're leaned out and you're trying to make power and, you know, your cylinder head temps are, you know, scary high. Yeah, 580. Uh, <laughs> well, I never got... Mine cools pretty good, but from like four four fifty to the five hundreds, you know, five twenty five. I I really almost never go over five hundred. I really don't because I yeah. cool pretty well. But on the way down, when I when I said ah, I'm going to go back, and I pulled it back, and suddenly I saw CHTs at like two hundred and twenty. Yeah, I was like crap, and like I almost thought the engine died. Right, you know, and so I but I cold I closed that cow flap. And cylinder head temps went back up to like 350. I was like, all right, cool. So I think that's a real key is being able to like manage that temperature on the way back down. Yeah, there's there's a lot of temperatures to manage when you climb up that high. Yeah. It's it's hard. It's not it's a very technical flight. Yeah. The way up. Yeah. I think um I think our airplane could be ready to to go after Jim's record pretty quick with, with Zato flying it could be available pretty quick. Um, and I think that'd be fun to try to beat Jim's record. Uh, your airplane will definitely will beat ours. I mean, you're, you're going to be lighter as far as I know. Oh yeah. And, and your wing is probably a little better, uh, and should be a little lighter. It's a little, our wings, 142 pounds and yours is like 105 or 110 or something. Yeah. But, you know, if you turbo and stuff, then it's like it's shattered. The question is, can you do it with normally aspirated like those guys? That's the real. It's not a separate record, but what'd be interesting is to beat Jim with normally aspirated. Well, the the equation is horse your 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 ceiling your mm -hmm. the highest you can fly your airplane is simply when the horsepower available. Mm -hmm. reduces itself until you're at the horsepower required of the airplane at that speed. Yeah. And you want to find the speed that requires minimum horsepower to stay in the air. Mm -hmm. And that's how you hit that ceiling. Yeah. So you're right. So the trick to going higher is either reducing your drag or your, your horsepower required to stay at that speed or increasing your horsepower, especially yeah. horsepower at altitude. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you can do nitrous, you can do turbos, you can do all that kind of stuff. I mean, the thing about turbo is you you really needed that top part, so it hurts you when you're lower for altitude to climb, but not really, you know. Yeah. But a turbo, you know, the thing is like, like if we're going for that 1100 pound record, it's easy to put a turbo on a castle. Oh yeah. Easy, plenty of weight, plenty, plenty of weight. There's there's enough that I can make that weight. You know. Oh yeah being a fat guy but you to meet it i mean you're you know you should be with fuel 800 pounds Man. well i think i think i can carry like like 60 gallons or 65 gallons before Go i hit the, that the weight limit. you only need to carry like seven gallons yeah just enough to get there yeah you just need to get there and not run out of gas but, well on the way down you're running like half a gallon an hour right yeah Cool. Well, I think I think like a controllable pitch prop would be a huge help. I was listening to like what um, 
Bruce did in the uh, in the Tiger Cat in the Exxon. Gee, what is it? His airplane, the, the yeah, Exxon, yeah, the tiger, Flying yeah. Tiger. Yeah, the Flying Tiger. You know, he's playing with the prop a lot, so that's in all his published information. But so I don't know, man. It's just fun. These airplanes are so cool, and you can do so much with them. It's fun to have a, a goal. My goal this year was Air Venture Cup. You know, that's until what it's canceled. For, until it's canceled, because it was like I'm going to kill that record that I built. I set the record, but it was so slow because I was running out of fuel. It was 186 point something miles an hour, and it should have been 200. Yeah. I didn't carry enough fuel, so I was going to try to just smash it at like 220 <laughs> this year and uh, by carrying enough fuel because it'll easily do 220 cross country. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, I agree. I can do 200 with my slab red plane. Yeah. No and problem. So I wanted to do my goal is 220, but then it got canceled. And now it's like, what a bummer. Like, I know. Just, so it's like, what else do we do with it? It is. It's so much fun just to go out and fly, and I fly it to meetings, so I fly it all the time. I agree. Yeah, and it's a. It flies really nice. Yeah, yeah. You should come fly it, and then you'll. Yeah, I know, except it's two weeks house arrest for when we come back across the border. Uh, well, you could sneak. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, that'll go well. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's wrap it up here, Brian. What do you think? Do we talk yeah. about enough stuff, Brian? Yeah, we talked about tons and tons of stuff. Cool. That was a good hour 15. That's a good length. Yeah. What's your, what's the, what's like the name of your podcast? We're called uh, Dead Dead Stick Radio, and you can find us on uh, Facebook. Uh, We're on YouTube now. We're also on pretty much any podcast app you want, iTunes and whatnot. So just Dead Stick Radio. That's it. So I think what I want to do is for all your listeners is offer them a deal with Grip Lock Ties. So if they go on to griplockties.com and they place an order and use the code DEADSTICK, they get free shipping. It's set to Canada. <laughs> it's too expensive. <laughs> I'm sorry, Canadians. It's too expensive. <laughs> but we are available on Amazon.ca. But um, no, that that's great. Yeah, yeah, most most of our listeners are in the states, anyways. So yeah. So griplockties.com, use the code DEADSTICK. Bam. Free shipping. You'll get a whole bunch of these. Yeah. They're really, really, really nice. They're all through all of my airplanes. And if you want half price, use it twice. (laughs) I I love them. Uh, You guys use them in airplanes. I use them uh, in data centers. They're great. They're so much better than the stupid Velcro pieces of crap. And those, they just work so much better. Yeah. Oh. Cool. Grip lock ties are just better. So I appreciate you guys plugging my stuff. That's I need to sell tons and tons of grip lock ties so I can take over the world and eliminate crappy zip ties from the planet and I provide agree. a better future for our, for humans. When are the little ones coming? I got some here. They're pretty awesome. We're doing a, our next mold run um, on the 29th. So I sent you one, didn't I? No. Nope. There's one of them in your package. Look in your package. I think I sent you one. I didn't look that close. I've got two bags. Yeah. So I'll look. look. Again. Okay. I've been sending some. You want to see one? Yeah, oh, yeah, one definitely. All right. Man, this this is big. Brian, we're going to have to make a highlight of this. Oh, yeah. Well, I've got the splash screen of the grip lock ties splattered across the stream right now. The first miniature grip lock tie. All right. Announced so, for the world. So these are all organized by cavities. Um but here is here oh. is so this is our 12 inch and this is our 8 inch oh man and those are going to be epic oh yeah I pre-ordered a bag yeah thank you um, what, uh, what colors do those all come in the rubber lining is an orange, red and blue and it still has a little release right there so open it up. Oh, yeah. Can't wait. Awesome. This mold. Oh, my gosh. was such a total. It's a definite barrier to entry. Let me tell you what. <laughs> so, yeah. Plus all of our huge patents. So and I got mean lawyers. So. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, Greg. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. Use the code dead set. Woohoo! Thanks, guys. Thanks. Go build airplanes and go flying.